Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the Urban Institute. Uh, I'm Marjorie Turner. I'm Senior Vice President uh, for Program Management and Planning here at the Urban Institute. And I really want to thank you for venturing out on this incredibly hot afternoon uh, to join us for what I think is going to be a really uh, uh, important and provocative discussion about the intersection between early childhood education and uh, health and well-being. We have a great uh, crowd uh, here in the room today, but I also want to be sure to welcome our online audience, uh, people who are tuned in from across the country. I encourage everybody, whether you're here or online, uh, to uh, continue the dialogue uh, that we start here uh, in the room uh, by sharing your thoughts, your observations on social media using the hashtag uh, live at urban. And you can also include speakers' Twitter handles, which are in the agenda that you have for today. Uh, and if you are on the webcast as opposed to in the room, uh, you can submit questions for the discussion sessions um, to events at urban.org. And you can submit those anytime, and somebody will pass them along and get them uh, into the conversation that's ongoing. So supporting uh, policymakers and community leaders with solid research evidence is what the Urban Institute is all about. So we're really thrilled to be hosting this inaugural Policies for Action event uh, with the support of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Policies for Action, which um, we had to turn into an acronym, P4A, um, is a, a signature research initiative uh, that uh, collaborates with experts and scholars across many disciplines to shed light on how our social sector policies and laws and market practices support or undermine population health, well-being, and equity. P4A is a signature program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Urban Institute is really proud to be serving as the National Coordinating Center and also as a research hub. And that work is happening under the leadership of our senior fellows, Lisa Dubay in our Health Policy Center and Lottie Aaron in our Labor, Human Services, and Population Centers, uh, both of whom, whom will be moderating panels this afternoon. P4A is building uh, robust, actionable evidence uh, about how policies, laws, and other levers, uh, including those in the private sector, can advance what uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation so powerfully refers to as a culture of health. Um, and this work has the goal of not just producing new research, producing new evidence, uh, but delivering the evidence and insights from it to policymakers, to community leaders, and to other change agents on the ground. So as, as we say here at Urban, we're working really hard uh, to elevate the debate using research uh, because we think that evidence has the power to strengthen public policy and practices in ways that ultimately improve uh, people's lives. So today, uh, the conversation we'll be having is about working at the intersection of research and practice, research and policy, but also at the intersection of early childhood education and health, uh, with the goal of driving real improvements uh, in uh, health and well-being for our nation's children. And again, I want to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for providing the support that makes this uh, event possible. We'll have two terrific panels. Uh, the first focuses on building the evidence base, and that will be led by Lisa Dubay. And the second, uh, on uh, turning that research into action, led by Lottie Aaron. And Lisa and Lottie will introduce uh, the panelists um, when they uh, uh, start those sessions. Unfortunately, um, one of our speakers, Jorge Luis Garcia, uh, was stranded today in Chicago because of storms there. So we're really delighted to be welcoming Rich Neiman, um, who's worked exclusively with that same uh, research team um, and has stepped in on super short notice uh, to, to uh, fill in. So after both panels are done, I'm hoping that you can all stick around uh, for the reception that will follow immediately. Um, where we're really pleased also to be welcoming representatives 
from the DC Office of the State Superintendent of Education and from Ray's DC uh, to highlight um, work they're doing on the Our Children, Our Community, Our Change initiative here in DC. And I'll say just a little bit more about that later. So uh, let's begin our program. I think Lisa. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lisa Dubay. I'm a senior fellow here at the Urban Institute in the Health Policy Center, and I'm also the co-director of um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Policies for Action National Coordinating Committee. It's a big sentence there. Um, we're really excited to be sharing with you some of the new research that's coming out of the Policies for Action program. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our uh, two speakers. Um, First, you're going to hear from Sherry Gleed, who is um, the dean of um, NYU's Wagner School of um, Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, and um, her research comes out of the Wagner School's Policies for Action Research Hub. And as Marge mentioned, um, Jorge Garcia is not going to be with us today, but um, well, he might be here by the end. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I'd like. I'd I like, may get hooked out. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to introduce Rich Neiman, who's really graciously offered to step in at the, la at the last minute. And Rich is the president of Neiman, the Neiman Collaborative, which is a social impact marketing um, firm that's helped both amplify and translate the work that um, James Heckman has done and over the last decade. And so um, the research that he's going to be presenting comes from the, a grant that was given to uh, the University of Chicago and the U University of Southern California through our Policies for Action group. Um, so Rich and Sherry are each going to talk for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to have a little bit of a discussion, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So I'm just going to turn it over to hey. Sherry. Let me see if I can make this thing work. Um, hi, I'm Sherry Gleed, and I'm excited to talk about some really interesting new work we've done at uh, the NYU P4A Hub. Um, this is work that is joint with Kai Hong, who's a postdoctoral fellow at NYU, and Casey Dragon, who's an epidemiologist with us. So let me start off, so everyone can see that, um, and tell you a little bit about where we're coming from in this research project. Really two very different places, but, but very related. Um, there's a lot of literature on pre-K and early childhood education, and it's got this odd flavor to it. Um, many of the studies find robust short-run effects that fade out. So kids do better at the beginning, and then um, by grade two or three, those, those effects fade out. But then they reemerge late in life, um, and later in life. And, and Rich is going to talk a lot more about that. But um, so we have this long, this, this, the, these sort of short-run effects that fade out, and the long-run effects. And so one thing that we were interested in studying is whether maybe some intervention related to health, something about health, might explain this paradox of why we see short-run and long-run effects. It might explain a little bit of it. Um, the second thing we wanted to do is that uh, most of the studies, really good studies on, on early childhood, have focused on really um, well-done, randomized, controlled trials of very small populations. But from a policy perspective, you also want to know what happens when you run something at scale. Um, and so we had this extraordinary opportunity to study the rollout of universal pre-kindergarten in New York City, which is definitely scale. Um, and we thought we would look at both of those. And so we, we start off with really um, a somewhat agnostic sense of how pre-K might affect health, coming out of the existing literature. Um, which says that there are some ways that pre-K might actually improve kids' health and other ways in which pre-K might actually disadvantage children. So it might improve kids' health because they're more likely to get to health screenings, they're more likely to get immunizations. Um, maybe because they're with other kids, you're more likely to pick up developmental clues, things that are not going well with kids. Maybe you can catch stuff earlier. On the other hand, there's a literature that says, you know, actually putting little kids with a lot of other little kids might not be so good for them. Maybe they get sick more often because they catch infectious diseases. Um, maybe they develop behavioral problems because uh, they're exposed to more aggression. And there's actually literature on both sides, um, often from fairly small studies, that shows kind of both sets of results. So New York City and pre-K. Um, Bill de Blasio ran for uh, mayor of New York back in 2013. New York City mayoral elections are in these off years. We're, we have, we're coming into the next one right now. And one of his main campaign promises was to offer a seat in, for every four-year-old in the city uh, in early pre-K. Um, so he was elected in the fall of 2013. And I actually think this is kind of a remarkable thing. I would like us to write a paper about this, too. By the fall of 2014, they were ready to roll out pre-K for almost the entire city. So in one year, they moved from having 19,000 kids in city pre-K to 53,000 kids in city pre-K, which is an extraordinary 
uh, increase. And there were actually no horrible stories. Um, I am a veteran of the rollout of healthcare.gov, so um, <laughs> the, the fact that there were no horrible stories was, was nice to see. Um, and the largest gains in, in enrollment were in low-income communities and immigrant communities in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. Um, the city was really good in, in being able to get leverage funds from New York State and also in working with community-based organizations to roll out um, the pre-K program. Some important features of the pre-K program, it's actually been lauded as one of the best um, large-scale pre-K programs in the country. So people who have looked at it have said it's, it, it, it's very good in terms of the, the quality of, of, of features in it. And it includes some important health things as well, um, developmental screenings, letters about developmental concerns that have to go to parents and guardians, lots of compliance with Department of Health standards, and fairly high educational qualifications and staff and qualifications for the teachers. So this is, this is a universal pre-K program that's actually operating at a fairly high quality threshold. Okay, so that's sort of one side of the whole story. The second side is the health side of the story and where we come into this. And we came into it because um, we built our research hub around an extraordinary resource. We have all New York State Medicaid claims from 2006 to the present. Um, so we know everything that happened to anybody on Medicaid from 2006 to the present. It contains claims for about six to seven million New York State residents a year, including inpatient, outpatient, and pharmacy claims. We actually have a lot of demographic information about all the people in it as well. Um, so our Policy for Action Hub is tasked with um, developing partnerships across NYU faculty and with New York City agencies to really think about the impact of social services, including things like pre-K on the health sector. Now what we discovered is that we were able to do a really kind of cool quasi-experimental design with these data. And it's basically based on two kinds of identification happening at once. One is kids are only eligible for pre-K if they're born in the right interval. So kids were eligible for pre-K in 2014 if they were born between January 1st, 2010 and December 31st, 2010. Kids who were born earlier than that were not eligible. Kids who were born later than that were not eligible in the first year. So we had this regression discontinuity design for those of you who are uh, methods wonks. Um, so we have this reg regression discontinuity design. But the problem with a regression discontinuity design if you're looking at early childhood is that you're looking at kids who are developing. And so you expect that things are going to be changing even along fairly small thresholds. And we actually find that in our data. Um, but we were able to actually exploit the fact that we also had this rollout of UPK. So we could actually compare that regression discontinuity between the year in which UPK was rolled out and the year prior to that. So for the kids who were born a year earlier, they had a much lower chance of being exposed to pre-kindergarten than the kids who were, who were born later. But even within each year, um, you have this regression discontinuity. So um, we're actually able to capture both elements of identification here. I'm not going to go into bandwidth. Um, it also allows us to actually do um, a series of um, separate experiments involving different children whom we actually observe in the data and who are exposed and we, whom, on whom we can do this RDD. So one is what we call the oldest children who were eligible for UPK in 2014 compared to those who were just a little bit too old to qualify in 2014. Then we look at the youngest children in 2014, that is, those who were eligible for UPK in 2014, compared to those who were just a little bit too young to get into, into UPK in 2014, right? And then we can do the same thing in 2015. We have another group of kids um, who were youngest, who were eligible in uh, 2015, compared to those who were just a little bit too young in 2015. And then we can actually look at the oldest kids when they enter kindergarten a year later. So with this construct, we can actually do a number of different experiments, and we're going to follow them through. Um, so what did we find? Um, the main thing that we find that actually is really robust across all of these different experiments that involve, I think it's important to know, these are all different kids that are actually being seen in the experiments, is with respect to vision and hearing diagnoses and treatment. So what we find is that kids who are exposed to pre-kindergarten, universal pre-kindergarten, are much more likely to get a vision screening or a hearing screening or vision or hearing treatment um, in the pre-kindergarten year. We also see results for immunizations, which are not very surprising. You have to have your immunizations to be able to enter UPK. So kids' immunizations get moved up in time. But the vision and hearing results were a little bit more unexpected because uh, those are screenings that have to be done but, but might not have been moved up in time. So I don't know. Can you see this picture? This is, the, this is the cool picture, but you may not even be able to see the red dashed line. Um, what we find is that you can that Children who are born, uh, who, so this is a, a cumulative hazard model looking at the timing of your first vision treatment 
Um, and we find that at age four, kids who are eligible for pre-K are noticeably more likely to receive a first treatment for a vision problem. Uh, and this difference continues to persist through age five and a half. That is, kids are being picked up with vision problems in pre-K that wouldn't be picked up in kindergarten. So it's not like we just accelerated the timing of it. It's actually, it seems that they got treatment, they, they actually get picked up and they, and they continue uh, into, into kindergarten. Now, um, so, so it's not only, better direct, not only better detection of the problem, but actually, and not only just accelerating the treatment of the problem, but actually perhaps increasing the number of kids who are treated at all. Um, so this sort of supports the idea that health might be one of the pathways um, by which we see pre-K having long-term impact. And the way you might think about this is that kids who can't see well or hear well in the classroom might become, they might eventually learn how to read and write, but they might have a very different attitude towards school and towards their peers than kids who are actually doing well and thriving in the classroom and, and enjoying it. Um, so they, they really provide, this, these results provide some support for the idea that uh, pre-K can really be a vehicle for health improvement. Um, we, I'm not, I don't have time to go through the treatment untreated results, but these are pretty big increases, just to put it in context, the, these are pretty large size increases in vision and hearing treatment on the order of about 50% increases. So these are not trivial increases. And talking to people in other contexts and countries, these do seem to be conditions that are significantly underdiagnosed in low income children. Um, far fewer kids, many kids who need glasses or hearing, clean, cleaning their ears out, hearing, hearing aids and other things are not getting diagnosed in low income families. Um, so what happened since then? Well, in April, uh, Mayor de Blasio announced that we're gonna expand UPK and include all kids three years old and over. Um, so there's more evidence in support of UPK and uh, our evidence I think is a little tiny, tiny piece of that. Um, we also got a lot of press coverage for our working paper. Um, lots of people read about it and people in the city were really happy because they really, we, we had talked to them a little bit as we were going along, but they were very pleased to, to see some evidence of why what they were doing really mattered. Um, the paper also spurred a lot of interest from both other NYU faculty and other people in city government about ways to look at their programs using the same kind of data. And we actually entered into a collaboration with our Office of Criminal Justice Reform to look at how we could use our data, our same Medicaid data and sort of similar methodologies to look at issues in criminal justice reform. Um, very much because this paper got, pub got published and got, and got pressed. So it's been influential, influential both in the early childhood arena as well as in um, the, the policy arena more generally. So let me just stop there and let you go on and talk about pre-K. Great. Oh, I don't have anything to present because I can't present a researcher's deck. I was an English major and fine arts major and when I see a chart, I look at the lines and say, man, that looks cool. Uh, <laughs> My expertise is moving research uh, to impact. And for the last 10 years, I've worked with Professor Heckman and his team to figure out what was going on in policy and where their research could be relevant, and then translating the research that they do. Uh, what I did most recently is my firm work with Professor Heckman and his lead researcher, who can't be here, uh, Jorge Luis Garcia, on this paper called the cost-benefit analysis of the Abbasidarian care program in North Carolina. Uh, many of you know that this is one of the most famous random control trials in early childhood. It, it was uh, a comprehensive program from birth to five. It included health and nutrition as an input along with uh, early learning. And the curriculum was a whole child curriculum. So it's considered the gold standard that um, everybody says can't be implemented, but in fact is being implemented in many places around the country, maybe in a variety of different services that are, that are linked together. Uh, what we found, what Heckman found, is that uh, this program was initially seen as being way too expensive. And what he said is, well, let's look at the cost-benefit analysis of that and see whether or not it pays for itself. Uh, and it turns out that it, it really does. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the research here and then about its policy uh, implications. Now this research was uh, funded by uh, the foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's um, Policies for Action Program, or P for A, we're in Washington, everybody has talking initials here. Uh, also by the Buffett Early Childhood uh, Foundation and the uh, Pritzker's Child, uh, uh, Pritzker Children's Initiative. 
So what the CBA does is it follows up on some work that Heckman did, which was analyzing the health effects of the Abbasidarian program. Um, but at, and what happened with Abbasidarian, it happened in the 1970s, largely African-American low-income population in North Carolina. The program was run by the Frank Porter Graham Institute. And uh, they did this comprehensive child care, but they followed the treatment and controls up to age 35. And at periodically, they would do uh, health sweeps of this population in addition to their social and economic status. Uh, so what Heckman did and his crew did is they went in and they looked at the health effects um, all throughout the years and then at 35. Uh, so they basically have, uh, they quantified economic gains in child, of child care, uh, adult health outcomes along with education, employment, and sociability. So you're really looking at the, the input of whole child, early childhood education with what happens with the whole, wholly developed adult in the treatment group. Uh, this was center-based care. Uh, it was uh, pretty much high quality. It, it was high quality in that standard. It started at birth uh, and it uh, operated in according with uh, developmental principles. Uh, the elements of this program really exist today, although in a whole bunch of kind of different services that are siloed. Uh, one is uh, child health care and child well-being. The other is home visiting. Uh, there's nutrition. There's an early learning component. There is a very uh, strong child care component in the sense that uh, the, the children and the parents had about eight to nine hours of coverage in terms of child care, which really freed up the parent to enter both education and labor markets, uh, which was very <coughs> beneficial, and there was a preschool program. They also did something great where they followed the kids into the public school system to make sure that they were adjusting. They felt that they were going from a very developmental program to a less developmental approach, and they wanted to make sure that transition could happen. So for the first time in this cost-benefit analysis, health benefits were calculated to determine the economic value of better health outcomes driven by treatment. Uh, and this is driven by all of the treatment. We, they couldn't really disaggregate the treatment. Um, so uh, what they did is they took the previous uh, findings on the health findings, particularly there were strong health findings around males and females, but particularly around male health. Um, and then they had them quantified by a research group out in California at the UC, USC Schaefer Center. And what they did is they put them through a model of what the cost savings would be in terms of uh, uh, health care. So the new findings in this cost-benefit analysis um, are really strong. And they show that qual uh, starting early with high quality really pays off. The cognitive and social and emotional fade out that we often see in other programs that we saw in the Perry program, we do not see in the Abbasidarian program at all. Uh, providing this combination of early health and learning produces a 13% return on investment uh, per child per annum, so it keeps uh, going up. This program more than pays for itself. These returns are higher than the 7 to 10% return that Heckman found on Perry Preschool, and that's strictly because of the health uh, outcomes. Uh, and also that child care very much pays off, that um, basically by freeing the mothers up to enter the, into the workforce, uh, the programs basically paid for themselves in maternal <coughs> income gains uh, by the time the child entered kindergarten. So the key findings is that the scaffolding of support, particularly early health, really very much uh, uh, creates an economic benefit both for the child, the parent, and society. Early health as an input is really key to later uh, adult outcomes, particularly in the reduction of chronic disease. Metabolic syndrome among males uh, was significantly reduced in the treatment group. Metabolic syndrome uh, that was evident among males in the control group at age 35 was 25%. So if you have a control group with 25% metabolic syndrome at age 35, that's an expensive uh, prospect going forward. And that the child care had a two-generational effect. 
it helped the mother in, return to work and raise their income, make more investments in the child. It also increased uh, the child's prospects. The children did um, much better. In terms of the early health services, they had much of the screenings that you were talking about. They had early nutrition. Uh, the child, if they found a problem in screening, were referred to outside doctors. The doctors then, uh, the, the nurse staff that was part of this, uh, the doctor and the nurse were on staff, they would then do medical compliance with uh, the family. Um, the health outcomes are very much confirmed here. We have better physical health from childhood through adulthood, particularly in fighting uh, unhealthy uh, behaviors and obesity. Females were less likely to start drinking at an early age and more likely to engage in physical activity, eating nutritious foods, and less likely to fall into prehypertension. Males had this significantly higher levels of good uh, cholesterol and hypertension, central obedi uh, obesity, and dys um, dyslipidemia, which I can't pronounce, uh, was really not present where it was present in the control group at 25%. Uh, percent. And these outcomes um, attributed to early health, nutrition, and learning provided this healthy foundation uh, in the future. So what does that mean in terms of policy takeaways? It means that when you're out there advocating for early health and early nutrition, this study says that people should be investing in early health and early nutrition as an input. It means that there's an economic argument here for putting health and early learning together because it's that combination of early health setting that, as Robert Wood Johnson Foundation would say, culture of health early has very significant later outcomes. And that in terms of family support, this is really powerful evidence that we need to have a scaffolding of family support around low income families and making that investment more than pays for itself. It has a 13% return on investment. So as people are talking about fighting poverty, uh, which is an issue that both the left and the right are talking about, your issues of combining early health as an input and early learning are critically important to anybody's agenda in, in fighting poverty. Okay, thank you both. Um, so as, as Marge said earlier in, in the day, um, the Policies for Action program is really designed to try and fund actionable research to build the culture of health, which, um, w and I think um, a lot of the research that, some of the research that we funded has been looking at health healthcare sector policy in, in effects and, and what difference they make, but m most of the research that we funded has <coughs> actually been like these two studies looking at how these non-health care sector policies influence both health and health equity. And as someone who's doing some of the research also, I know it can be really challenging. We live in these very siloed worlds as researchers, as policymakers, as um, funders. And um, I think what, what Policies for Action is really trying to do is integrate these silos at, at many different levels, at the research level, at the funding level, and at the policy level. And so it's really actually kind of hard to do some of that work. And so I want to just start by asking, I'm going to start with Sherry, and just ask you to talk a little bit about what sort of the opportunities and the challenges are of doing this type of cross-sector work. Thanks. So this has been a really interesting ride working on um, the P4A hub because the way that we set it up, we were trying to figure out what kind of candy can we offer researchers and the city of New York and policymakers that will make them come to us and have us do some analysis for them and help them, help get them to help ask us questions that are interesting. And it turned out that having the, these data was just wonderful candy. If we could explain to them that we could find answers to questions that they really cared about using our data, they were actually interested in coming to us. Um, but in order to do that, we actually had to amass a set of skills that, that are pretty broad. So this particular study, um, we worked somewhat with our child development group, which is in the Steinhardt School, um, Sabelle Raver and Pam Morris and other people who, and Larry Aber who work on child development and who had worked very, very closely on the rollout of pre-K. So we were able to talk to people there about what they were doing and make sure that we had sort of the facts right. Um, and also to plug into them as we got, we, when we had the results, um, which was actually, it was really nice for them to learn that what they had been doing 
pay, was really was paying off. And it had been, and you can just imagine what an effort it was to make this, to roll this whole thing up. So it was, it was very gratifying for them also to, to see how that worked. Um, over time, we've actually added more kinds of expertise to our hub. So now we have a person who is a machine learning expert because we're doing a bunch of work on housing. And it turns out for that, machine learning is really a very effective kind of tool. Um, and then we built up connections both with our Housing Policy Institute and the folks in New York City, uh, City who are working on housing. Um, and then the criminal justice people really just came to us because they heard that we were doing the work. So um, it's been, what's been kind of, what's been nice, and I think that this is really what, what Professor Heckman and his team have, have learned over time, is that um, we do have these opportunities to deploy data and analytic techniques um, that really can support policy making and support policy makers. It's not necessarily that the evidence drives the policy. I wish that that were true. It's not always true. Um, but having the evidence does give the people who want to push the policy forward, I think, some momentum and some energy and some, they want to do the right thing. And so it's really nice to be able to kind of give them support to do that, even if you don't, even if you're not just plugging your result right into the political process. So, Rich, I know, you, you know you've been working with Dr. Heckman for a decade at this point. Can you talk a little bit about the extent to which you bring in policymakers or other stakeholders, even at the beginning of the sort of the research process, to ask, ask the questions or help frame the questions? Or how, how do, what does that interaction look like for you? Well, the first thing we do is we keep Professor Heckman and his, and his research team separate from the politics and policies. They, they never endorse a, a piece of politics or endorse a piece of policy. So what our role is is to really figure out what the current policy context is and what, where, the, where advocates are, where other evidence is, and where Professor Heckman's uh, research can add some sort of benefit. So we know uh, what people are looking for on the Hill on both the Democratic and the Republican side. And so when they were doing this, this work on the first part of Abbasidari and the analysis and the CBA, we were actually commenting on the paper and saying, you know, if, if in this piece of research that you have, it, you may not realize this, but this is very important to a group of people who could really move this legislation. So we brought it up to the front and we built it out in terms of the research. And then when it came out, we brought that to those individuals and said, here it is, this is what you've been looking for. So th that's the way we dovetail research with policy. Do you have anything to add about that? In, yeah, I mean, we haven't, we, we have, we have really tried to be pretty studiously neutral as well. I mean, I think we, we have been talking to people mostly about um, where the questions are for, for them. <coughs> where, what, mostly, I mean, this is also just from, from my experience of this. It's one thing in the legislative process, which tends to be very politicized. A lot of what we're talking about when we're working with the city of New York is actually more in what you might call the regulatory process. It's not necessarily, and I think that's a, an interesting aspect of trying to do evidence-based policy making is sort of what is the, where does evidence enter the policy process? And in many cases, I think evidence works most effectively on the regular, regulatory side, which is usually less politicized. The goal is already set, and people are trying to figure out what the best way to achieve it is. So one of the things that we're hoping to get out of this, for example, in thinking about in, in working with the city is there are real opportunities around, about, around developmental screenings. There are real opportunities to get hearing and vision services to kids, and they really do seem to matter. So put a little focus there, and that's a way um, that the, the, regular, you know, that the Medicaid offices, they're not, it's not political at that point anymore. It's just how do we do this? Okay, so I think at this at this point we're going to open it up to, um, to the audience. If those if there are people out there who are joining us virtually and you have questions, you can um, send an email with your question to events at urban.org. And um, I would just ask people to to one be succinct succinct in their in your questions, but also to identify who you are and what organization <coughs> you're with. So got a question over here. Um, someone's going to bring bring you a mic. Uh, Cliff Johnson at the National League of Cities. Sherry, I'm wondering what you learned about the potential negative uh, consequences of being in pre-K, the infectious diseases, the aggressive behavior, uh, increased risk of injury. Right. So um, we we have one negative result on a that. Well, I don't even know if it's a negative result. We have a result on asthma, but it's not robust. So it shows up in one year, but not in all of our samples. 
Um, we did not see an increase in infectious diseases or injury, which was interesting. Um, and actually, we were really interested. We did a side study because of exactly that question about what the impact of UPK was on the spread of flu. So we were, we were pretty sure that influenza might spread. Um, and we went through two or three influenza seasons. We actually could not find any evidence that influenza spread more aggressively after UPK had come in, which is kind of surprising in a way. You would think that putting all those kids together would be a great vehicle for, we haven't had a terrible influenza season in this time, but we didn't see anything. And we, you know, we did the epi work looking at it. Now, I will say that some of the previous research that has found negative effects of um, early childhood, thing, ch childhood on things like aggressive behaviors, those may not be diagnoses that get, diagnoses that get picked up in Medicaid data. So, I mean, this is, I don't want to suggest that using Medicaid data is the be all and end all of doing early childhood research. It's a very limited, we're seeing a very, very limited piece of the puzzle. Um, in that piece, we're not seeing a lot of negative consequences. Could, could I add that in the, uh, the Abbasidarian study, they, uh, Professor Heckman just did an analysis of effects by gender and uh, they also weighed it across uh, alternatives to center-based care. So there was the high quality care, there was lower quality care, and then there was staying at home with the mother. And it turned out that for uh, males, they actually had a worse effect if they were in low quality care than if they stayed with their mother. Uh, so it really speaks to the need to have high quality in these programs to make sure that children get the outcomes that they need. Right here. Hi, I'm Judy Berman. I'm with DC Appleseed. Um, and I think it's really interesting that you saw that the effect, the negative effect that you saw was with asthma. And I wonder, we I'm did not a- sure if it's a negative effect. We just saw more oh, diagnosis more asthma. Um, we did a research study with, um, with partners at Urban, actually, about the impact um, on why low-income families struggle to manage childhood asthma, even, af even following uh, best practice interventions. And one of the things that we found had to do with multiple caregivers, uh -huh. um, which kind of made sense because different people respond differently to symptoms and maybe the medication is not on hand and things like that. And it's just something I wonder, you know, coming from D.C. and thinking about the impact of pre-K where you've got three and four-year-olds spending part of their day in one setting and part in another um, if there's negative effects that might be anticipated and policy actually driven around that. One of the things, sorry, I'm going on, but right. Abbasidarian, right, had eight to nine hours. Um, universal pre-K in the district is basically from like 8.30 or, or 9 to 3, and then they've got to find aftercare or before care in the summer, you know, they're kind of on their own. So just a right. couple of thoughts to throw in there. If, I don't know if you have any reaction to right. that. So we, I mean, what we saw is an increase in asthma diagnoses, and that's why I'm not really sure whether that is a positive thing or a negative thing. Um, we didn't see any increase in emergency room visits or stuff like that. Now, these are kids are pretty young. They're only four, and so maybe that's what, what we're seeing. Um, but it is what it is. That's, that's where we are. Um. Hi, I'm Kylie McLean. I'm with the ARC of the US. Um, I'm wondering if you saw similar impacts of early childhood education on children with special needs, um, in particular to health outcomes. So we did not focus in on children with special needs in this study. We are actually doing one right now that looks at um, kids with autism and related disorders. So we will be focusing on them um, and on their, their use of services and access to Medicaid. And uh, if tune in, check our website and around, around October, November, we should have results by then. Yeah, right in, in the front row here. This is Noreen from Twim Research. So in picking up the population, for example, in Medicaid, um, do you expect to see some sort of biases? For example, they, the children that are in that group tend to be a little bit more on the lower income side. Do you expect to see some biases in terms of that? Or do you, like, was the intent of this study to see the impact within the lower income community? It's a good question. So um, our focus was really on the low income Medicaid eligible population. Um, and that is where the biggest impact of universal pre-kindergarten in New York also was. So that was the population of interest. It's universal, so, so higher income kids could also go to universal pre-K, but a lot of those kids were already in full day pre-K in other kinds of programs. Um, the big marginal impact was really on those low-income kids, and that's where our focus had really been. Um, we have been doing some work 
rec more recently on kids of different incomes in Medicaid, we were actually finding some really interesting patterns in terms of what happens to higher income, middle income, you know, low. They were, these are all low income kids, but the higher income of the low income kids in our sample. Um, and I think that basically, I don't. You probably have a sense of this from from the work that you, you've all been doing, but. Middle income and higher income kids are doing pretty well, whether they're in pre-K or they're not. They're, they're in high quality settings and they're getting a lot of services and their pediatricians are picking up on things and because their families are less stressed, they notice that the kid needs classes or whatever it is. Um, so our expectation is that, and, 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 and prior research on needs for vision and hearing care, for example, have noted that these needs are, they're, they're, they're more likely to have unmet needs in the lower income populations. The, the kind of the one caveat on that, that middle income kids are doing well, is that uh, the middle class is slipping and middle class supports are likely to slip. Uh, things like the Affordable Care Act are critically important for people on the, uh, on the border there and in the research that we've done with First Five Years Fund, which is another group that we work with, uh, middle class and more affluent parents are saying that they're finding it harder and harder to afford the early childhood care for their children. So that is slipping. So we actually have to wrap up this piece right now, but um, stay with us. And these two will be out in the reception afterwards, so you can ask any of your questions that you still have for them. But um, we're going to do a little musical chairs. You guys stay right where you are, and we're going to bring the panel right up. Um, thank you all. Uh, my name is Lottie Aaron. I co-direct uh, the P4A Policies for Action uh, program here at Urban with Lisa Dubay, the former moderator. Uh, and so now we have um, a panel that will help us better understand the opportunities and challenges in acting on the kinds of research that we just heard about in the prior panel. And we think we've assembled a dream team of uh, <laughs> panel leaders in the world of early education policy and practice. Um, I'm going to just say a few words about each of them. And you have uh, longer biographies in your packets. Um, and then give them each a few minutes to, to speak about what they bring to these sets of issues and what their experiences are. We'll then have some Q&A among the panelists and then open it up to the Fuller group as well. So to my left, we have uh, Gail Manchin. She is an educator, advocate, and leader who brings a wealth of expertise from her home state of West Virginia, where among many other accomplishments, she launched as West Virginia's First Lady, uh, a statewide initiative known as West Virginia Partnerships to Assure Student Success. Along with many other insights uh, she'll be sharing with us, we'll be learning from Gail about the importance of building and sustaining partnerships to advance the work that we're talking about today. Uh, next, we have Albert Watt. He's a senior policy director at the Alliance for Early Success, where he supports strategies and goals for early education, and in particular, improving access to high quality pre-K, uh, attending to the early learning workforce, uh, and also aligning uh, early education policies with K through 12 education policies. 
He's also worked at the Education Division of the National Governors Association in their Center for Best Practices, and before that at Pre-K Now at the Pew Center of the States. He has worked with schools, school reform groups, and community-based organizations in the Bay Area, in southeastern Michigan, and here in, in D.C. Uh, next, we have Tanja Rucker, who directs the Early Childhood Success Programs in the Institute for Youth Education and Families at the National League of Cities. She oversees strategy development, policy coordination, and uh, helps document best and promising practices around early education. Tanja works with mayors, city council members, other municipal officials in creating lo local systems of support for children, youth, and families. And we hope to be learning from a lot of her experiences across the country in those areas. Uh, and finally, we have Danielle Ewan, who's a senior policy advisor at Education Council. She has held many leadership positions in childcare and early education, including in the Office of Early Childhood Education here uh, in DC Public Schools, uh, and at the Center for Law and Social Policy, or CLASP. She's also worked at the Children's Defense Fund and the National Child Care Information Center. Not all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, her work spans federal, state, and local policy making, uh, as well as program development and oversight. So we will be learning a tremendous amount from her as well, I'm sure. And with that, Gail, I'd like to give you a few minutes to share with us. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to thank the Urban Institute for providing the opportunity for the discussion, and second, for inviting West Virginia to be able to have an intro integral part of the discussion, so thank you very much. Uh, serving currently as the Cabinet Secretary for Education and the Arts in West Virginia has really sort of brought my professional life full cycle because throughout my career I have dealt with children and families, I would say from conception until uh, lifelong learning. And so as the Cabinet Secretary, I now have a, a wonderful opportunity to both passionately advocate and promote all of these programs that I have worked with throughout my life. And so I'm enjoying that very much and being here is one of those opportunities. Um, what I would like to do though, and I've made notes so that I, I don't ramble, is there are five very basic points that I believe brought West Virginia to where they are today in terms of having a very uh, good, and nationally rated early childhood process and system. And so I think to go through those and then that we could elaborate more on it later. But first of all, I want to address two cliches that we hear uh, that is a part of this process. One of them is this is a marathon, not a sprint. And that's very true. And the second cliche, if it were easy, anybody could do it. And that's also true. So West Virginia has been on this uh, marathon for over a decade. And I would say we're still a work in progress. But, um, but we are, we're getting there. And what we have done, we feel like we have done well. And so that's based now on these five pointers. One is sound science. And how can I reiterate the two speakers that were just up here talking about research-based, evidence-based. I mean, that is critical to establishing uh, good decision-making, that architecture that goes into helping design the program, and also how it allows you to track your progress and track the program. So it tells you you know where you start, and as you proceed, you realize how far you've come, what progress you've made, but more importantly, it helps you set up those red flags, something I hope we'll talk about later, of what we've got to look forward to in the future <coughs> with our young children. The second point are wise investments, and that's at two levels. First of all, investing in the children at that early <coughs> age, from conception, investing in those children reaps high rewards in terms of building uh, young, intelligent, healthy adults that contribute to society. 
that become part of the economic development of your community and your state. The second wise investment is pulling your public and private partners in and their investment in money. The fact that you help them understand that by investing from children from birth, that that is what is going to reap rewards down the road in terms of sound economic development and quality communities in which you want to live and raise your family. So number three, then, uh, is leadership. Leadership at all levels. When you are talking about having healthy children ready to learn when they enter kindergarten, that happens because of a great number of leaders, leaders within the family, leaders within your community, building those types of programs, leaders at a state level, from your government leaders to your public and private partners, your nonprofits, your for-profits. These are people that have to come together with the right resources and support systems, one voice, one message, very passionately driven to sustain that type of level of programming. Number four, obviously quality programs and infrastructures. That's what you want for your early childhood programs. Uh, so you're, you want to specifically focus on a healthy learning environment. Healthy from the standard, physically healthy, mentally healthy, nutritionally healthy, and not just classroom, not just the child care centers, but healthy environments about professional development for all levels of child care, um, your governance, your infrastructure. And in order to do those, you have to have funding. And that goes back to, again, partnership, sharing, leadership. And number five is from this, from these four pointers, you hope then you start getting positive results which is critically important. I go back to the beginning of having that science-based research that helps you build the program that's going to, uh, to give you good information to track so you can show your progress, which is, again, absolutely essential. And this was brought up in, in the previous speakers. <coughs> that's how you get your funding to promote more research, more studies, is being able to show in these programs how you have progressed by using that evidence. And of course, if that all fails, you can always wear a patch and become a pirate. <laughs> 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 there you go. She gets a round of applause for that. <laughs> okay, so. Um, <laughs> I am not wearing a patch. I'm not intended to be a pirate. Um, Thank you for having me here, and, and I, could, I would just w want to say first off that it's really nice to talk about early childhood in a room full of people that I don't recognize. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I look forward to making some connections, and I think that's kind of the theme of this, of this event. Um, so just a few words to begin with about uh, what the Alliance for Early Success does, because I want to set the context as a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about, you know, kind of um, will be about what we do. So, we fund um, and otherwise in other ways support a network of state and national organizations um, that work collaboratively, collaboratively to work on um, to advance policy issues in early childhood in the states. Um, we focus on uh, issues related to early learning, health and family supports for, uh, that on, ki on issues that touch kids from birth through age eight. Uh, those of you who picked up our framework, this kind of describes what we, uh, the kind of issues that we um, invest in and, and focus on. In the past few years, we've been growing our investments in health um, and to really take advantage of, um, so that we can take advantage of the unique, I think a pretty unique network of, of these state and national organizations and bring the early childhood and health stakeholders together so that the advocacy in the states can um, kind of make an Im a greater impact on young children's health, learning, and development. Um, so just kind of kind of want to respond to the research a little bit. So in some ways, like I feel like we, we kind of know some of the general kind of top line like findings of the research, right? Like this is the devastating research has been out there in terms of the health outcomes and it's nice to sort of continue to get the quantifiable kind of cost benefit analysis out. Um, 
the Head Start research has been out there in a, in a way is very similar to what, what the New York study, um, uh, New York City study found. Um, and then there's also research about how, sh how strong executive function in the early years mm -hmm. can really matter in the long run, both in terms of health and, and in other li life turn out, li lifetime outcomes. Um, and then I also want to emphasize that we also know research on the, sort of the other direction in terms of, because most of what we talked about earlier was about the impact of early childhood on health, but health, um, outcomes in the early years also matter, obviously, on health outcomes in the later years, but also learning development. So we know, you know, some of the, particularly around he mental health, around the research around um, the adverse um, child care, I mean, childhood experiences kind of research, the ACEs research, research about toxic stress, those kinds of things, the mental health issues really, really matter a lot in the early years. Um, so, so what's new? What's the added value here that I, I think? I, I, and to me, I think there's at least three. Um, so the first is that um, I think it's always important to sort of reinforce this notion that early care and education can be a health strategy. Um, in our work, we're seeing more and more of our um, advocates at the state level incorporating health into their agenda and into their work. And, and one question that I have, not, not being a person that works um, closely with sort of the health um, uh, side of the, uh, side of the <coughs> issues, is whether that is happening on the health, you know, sort of for healthcare advocates and, um, and healthcare administrators and systems leaders, are they also building in early childhood issues into their, uh, early care and education issues into their work and into their advocacy work? Um, another added value, I think, is that um, sometimes I feel like that uh, to advance um, issues related, particularly related to infant toddlers, sometimes it's easier to maybe enter those conversations with policymakers. Um, and again, I wear this sort of state advocacy kind of state policy hat. Enter into this conversation with policymakers from the health door rather th than through the early learning door. Because to a lot of policymakers, when you talk about infants, they feel like, what do you mean early learning? We're talking about infants and babies. But they definitely get health. I mean, healthy babies is, is important. So, so I think the more connections we can make between those two um, uh, kind of worlds um, and then the research making those, those connections, um, that's helpful for, particularly for infant toddler agendas. Um, I think the third thing I would say is that um, I, I hope that what this research and more and more of this research uh, does is build this consensus that, you know, yes, early childhood and health are interconnected, the outcomes are intertwined, um, and, and that really help, you know, I, I would like to see us push to the next level of conversation about, so if this is true, what, what, how do we make these connections, you know, uh, more intentionally? So, um, how do we, for example, as policymakers, advocates, um, you know, uh, people who work in government, uh, encourage, support, incentivize, or we even require these kind of connections um, in a, in a, again, in a more intentional way in terms of, you know, more collaborative funding, fun, uh, more collaborative program, more pro collaborative policies. Um, and, you know, a couple of examples I thought of was, oh, well, one example I thought of was a few years ago there was a, uh, uh, Center for Disease Control grant that I don't know too much about it, but I remember when it came out, I was like, oh, this is interesting. It went out to state departments of health to, so that they can work sort of with a collective impact model with other agencies in that state to create strategies or implement strategies that would reduce um, early childhood uh, 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 abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think it's called the Essentials for Childhood uh, Grand Project. I don't know what, ha what, what came up of that out of that, and if people know, we'd love to hear it. And, and I think with the New York, New York City study, I would, it'd be great to dig into like how they were doing that. Like, what were the funding streams? What, you know, what staffing was required to, to make this work? Was it the Department of Education people doing it, or did they have collaborate with health? Like just kind of digging into those kind of mechanics would be, would be really helpful. I think this research can help us kind of, you know, again, take that next step into that, those kinds of conversations. That's great. Tanja. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you to have a few minutes to talk with you about the National League of Cities and how we're working with our member cities, over 19,000 cities, towns, and villages, um, to ensure that all young children get off to a great start in life. Uh, we've been working at this um, kind of work with young children for 17 years now, 
And so one thing that I, I think I want to share with you all is that regardless of party affiliation, we really see early childhood resonating with our members. Um, we work not just with mayors, but city council members, city managers, senior city staff, and across the political spectrum. This is one issue area that we see a lot of support, a lot of champions, and also a lot of investments. I think that one of the main reasons for that is that the work that we've been doing over the, the past 17 years is partnering with our um, national um, partners, our federal partners, our research partners, to really share good data and good research. And then we have been able to share these resources with our members to really help make the case of why to invest and why to support early childhood and, and well-being for young children. Um, you know, one thing that Sh as Sherry was sharing her research on New York, one thing that gets the creative juices flowing in our members is a little bit of competitive juices. And when they see their, their colleagues and peers in other cities doing such great work, such as the work that's going forth in New York, you know, they want to learn about how, the, how to do this and how to make this resonate with their um, residents locally. I think, you know, we all see that leaders want to be responsive to their residents. They want to make sure that they're providing quality services and programs. And so we've been able to share really great research and data. Certainly the work of Mr. Heckman has resonated locally. The work coming out of the Federal Reserve has really helped mayors make the case. And even in tight budget times with the economic recession, we've seen early childhood investments remain steady and in some cases increase while their counterparts in, in other areas have lessened. And so I think having that good data and for the National League of Cities to partner and rely on um, good national partners to help us make the case has really made a difference. But we do know that cities cannot do this work alone. And so much of our work um, in strategic planning with city leaders has been to increase their partnerships, to reach across the political spectrum, to engage diverse stakeholders, um, to engage parents in the voice of residents to make sure that you have and you're hearing from a large number of sectors as you make strategic plans, as you make investments. And the partnership piece, and as you said, Gail, as well, leadership, helping develop the capacity of parents and residents as we're thinking about strategic plans and investments. So I think this is some of the work that we've been doing for the past 17 years. And within the Institute, we have a, a robust early childhood portfolio. As I think about where the work is going and, and what we're seeing on the horizon around health and well-being, certainly the work around um, trauma mm -hmm. and toxic stress, and we're, we're happy to be partnering with Boston Medical Center to be doing some work at the local level to help local leaders really think about how to provide support services and agendas um, that really help strengthen the mental health and well-being of young children and families. Certainly, as well, we see a lot of work around immunizations, home visiting, the role that city leaders can play in investing in these types of, of local agenda items is really critical and important. Um, developmental screenings has been a place where a lot of mayors have made some inroads and we're very excited about some of the, the work that we see at the local level around screenings and really just making the case of these early investments and, and mayors really taking the charge and leadership. I would be remiss without talking a little bit about my colleague who leads our health and wellness work, Sue Polis. Um, you know, NLC hosted the work with the former First Lady, Michelle Obama, Let's Move Cities and Towns and Counties, and we're continuing that work where local leaders really stepped up to the plate to really invest and think about um, obesity in young children, nutrition, health and well-being, breastfeeding policies, and we're continuing to advance that work at the National League of Cities. Additionally, the intersection of health and housing um, and young children is something that we see emerging quite a bit, and we're excited about some of the great work that's, that's coming forth out of NLC and that agenda, as well as the opioid crisis. You know, as you think about local level challenges, um, the National League of Cities and, and the National Association of Counties have come together with local leadership, really advancing a robust agenda about what are some of the best policies and strategies to combat some of the, the work around the opioid crisis and how that impacts young children and families. So there's a lot of, of, of great, um, direction, future direction that I think that as NLC we can help our members build their capacity, develop their leadership and their advocacy, and certainly work with our research partners and national partners to advance a, a robust agenda. And so we're looking forward and excited about the next horizon. There are certainly challenges as we look at the federal landscape, 
well, really don't want to look at the federal landscape, <laughs> but we have to. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's layered work. And so part of what we do at NLC is not to just help our, our cities look at alignment, you know, within city departments, across city departments, across sectors, but also how we can work better with our state colleagues and our federal colleagues and make sure that there is, there is, that we're being responsive to the needs of all of our children and families and looking at their health and well-being. So we're excited about the work and the conversation we're going to have here today. So thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. Hi, everybody. It is an honor to be here. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, I think that this is one of the most important conversations we can have about young children and creating a culture of health. I would expand that to be a conversation nationally and at the state and local level uh, to have a conversation about healthy children and that children become the focus of the conversations we have, regardless of where we sit. And by that I mean whether we sit at the state, national, or federal level, whether we sit in schools, whether we sit in doctor's offices, whether we're part of the early childhood community doing programs and direct services, whether we're in the housing field, that children and making sure they are healthy and safe needs to become the core conversation that we have and to drive a lot of the policy decisions that we make. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I want to start sort of um, in the past. Some days I feel, as my brief bio suggested, that I'm actually 117 years old. Um, and so I want you to walk down the, you know, walk into the past with me for a minute and recognize that the history of early childhood has really always been a history of linking services for young children with their health outcomes. If you think about that famous picture of Marion Wright Edelman and Senator Kennedy standing in Mississippi and dreaming up Head Start, it was because of all of the things that those children needed, starting with both help and health and academic services. And that's how we got Head Start, in a two-generational focus um, that really was about making sure that children and families had what they needed to be successful. We've heard from, um, Albert talked about the Adverse Children's Experiences Study, which is a very similar look at what happens to children in early childhood and in later years, and then what happens to them as they move forward in their lives, understanding that getting them treatment and interventions early on can mitigate some of their experiences later on. We know that children have multiple, that children with more risk experiences, multiple risk experiences in their lives are at higher risk of poor outcomes. And we know that when we intervene with them, when we identify those risks early, as the National Center for Children in Poverty and Jack Shankoff has shown us, that we can really change the trajectories of their lives. And finally, and I think it's important to the conversation that we've had today, there's actually long-term research on the crack cocaine babies from the 80s and 90s that show that when those children had early childhood services that were high quality, many of the risk factors associated with being born drug addicted were mitigated in the long term. And so it's really important to remember that we have history and science and research on our side as we're having these conversations and that the new research adds value and helps make the case, but our history has always been one of linking early childhood experiences and health. And I think that contributes to this conversation and helps us tell the story, but also helps us remember that there are resources at every level that we can draw upon to make these, uh, to make these changes for children and families. So we know what works, and we know that there's, um, there, there are many models throughout the country. There, we saw the New York UPK program and developmental screenings. We know that there are connect connections at the community level. There are many hospitals doing early childhood programs to help make linkages with children and families. We know that Head Start has extraordinary requirements to support the comprehensive needs of children and families and do developmental screenings and other things. Um, but the question we, we are asking today, right, is what are the policies and practices that we can really think about that will better link early childhood and health? And I think one of the important things to think about first is that we're not just talking about the early childhood community, Head Start, Child Care, fill in your favorite provider, and health, doctors, right? It's about all the places where children are. Um, it's about schools. It's about housing. It's about um, the, the, the playgrounds that they're on. And so some of the policies that we've seen that bring these things together are things like the UPK model in New York where developmental screenings are a core component of what's required to be done. And this is something that can be done by every state pre-K program. It is a requirement. It requires some resources. It does require connections and training either with folks to do the screenings or to find places to do those screenings. But the first step is to say, this is important. It's important enough that we're gonna make it a requirement of participating in this program that we get these screenings for young children. And we're starting to see that across the country. 
in some pre-K programs. And we also saw it in the, um, in the reauthorization of the Child Care and Development Block Grant, that while we didn't get a requirement for developmental screenings, we got an increased focus on states looking at the developmental screening opportunities for young children. And in states like Rhode Island, they're using some of those child care funds to do what are called ages and stages for all children in child care programs, or as many as they can reach in subsidy. Another area where we can put policies in place that will change outcomes for kids is really thinking about required screenings like the EPSDT that pedi pediatricians already do and linking that to data systems at the community and state level so that we, both at the public level, states and local governments, but also private health insurers and others are tracking whether and how young children have, are being screened, are being seen, are getting the immunizations and the interventions that they need. Other quick things, because I just got the one minute flash. I'm going to talk really fast and y'all are going to take good notes, right? <laughs> Training for school nurses so that they are ready to see kids and know what to look for. Um, some of the Medicaid innovations that have been talked about in the past that are about linking the, the mother-child dyad to do maternal depression um, screening and other things. Thinking about how the Every Student Succeeds Act and some of the school quality, school climate indicators, especially around chronic absenteeism, can be used to link early childhood and health outcomes. Thinking about state and community regulations around things like recess. If children are only going outside 20 minutes a day, they, we do not have healthy young kids. So really think about those kind of policies. And finally, the but, but, but to all of this. The early childhood system, whether we're talking about academic outcomes, health outcomes, or any other outcomes for young children, has been one that has consistently been both underfunded and forced to either be entrepreneurs and find as many sources of funding as possible, or in a more negative sense, to cannibalize other people's money. And as we think about both the state and the federal environment that we're currently in, where we're facing cuts to Medicaid, we're being told we're going to block grant programs, that families, that if we're just more efficient with federal and state dollars, that more families will be better off, we are facing an environment where the questions we're raising will be much more difficult to answer through policy and regulation. And so as you're thinking about these connections, you're thinking about how to improve communities, you're thinking about the kinds of partnerships that we've heard today, it's really important not to undersell the fact that serving young kids and making sure they are healthy is something that requires significant investment at every level. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'm the cleanup hitter, you know. <laughs> also been called the cynic, you know. <laughs> um, you know, that's just a great start to the conversation I'm hoping we can have. Um, I, I'm interested in uh, uh, us all really digging in a little bit further into what you've seen the, the best role for research in this very broad um, set of issues we've talked about. Um, I know. Um, Sherry mentioned the opportunity to affect regulatory work. Uh, others have talked about the importance of partnerships and engagement and leadership development, so research can obviously play a role in that. And uh, you know, uh, just different observations that you've had about whether different research plays a different role at the local, state, or federal level, how it, it may vary over geography. We're not all New York City. We don't all have the resources that New York City has. Sorry, Sherry, but it's true. <laughs> um, and you know, any insights you bring uh, with respect to you know where research has played a really key role in advancing. Uh, action as opposed to just the knowledge base. Let's open that up, yeah. Well, I, I would just, because something that is very scary to me, and Danielle touched on this, but uh, in West Virginia, the opioid crisis is an epidemic, and I don't think it's just an epidemic in West Virginia. I think it's across our country. And we opened the first hospital in the nation called Lily's Place, which is where drug addicted babies are taken at birth and then hopefully their mothers also move in there and they try to get the babies to a um, successful point of being able to go home. But I think what we're facing and what researchers are going to have to look at is what is the long term effects of these babies from the different opioids, whether it's alcohol or prescription drugs or heroin or what it is that these children have been subjected to, what is the long-term effects and uh, decisions that will be made? The children, we have counties where over 46 percent of our children don't live in a home with a biological parent. 
because those parents are either in prison or dead because, because of drugs. Grandparents that have become parents, and that number just continues to increase. But we're talking about long-term mm -hmm. effects here. We're not just talking about when that baby leaves Lily's place and goes home. The problems do not end there. And to me, this is something very scary that's going to take everyone's effort and support uh, and resources to, uh, to try to, 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 to work with these children in the most positive and successful way. So from, <clears throat> from an advocacy point of view, mm -hmm. I can give an example of, of how research has sort of um, influenced the advocacy work. Uh, so some of you may be aware that in the past few years there's been a proliferation of policy actions on the issue of suspensions and, and expulsions in early childhood settings and also in the early elementary grades. Um, and I credit a lot of that attention to uh, the Office of Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education a few years ago came out with the data about the extent to which suspensions and expulsions <coughs> are happening, particularly to kids of color, right? So the, our advocates, a lot of our advocates looked at that and, and you know, and, and it was an important issue, they, they took it up. It could have easily been become a sort of a, a, the strategy could have been easily become like, you know, pass legislation to prohibit or, or uh, li minimize the pr use of these kind of practices, which has happened. But because of the research around what we talked about earlier about trauma in the early years, mm -hmm. how that affects brain development, how that affects learning, uh, you know, and behavior in, in, in these uh, early childhood settings, the advocates very quickly made the connection that, you know, this, you know, it's not just about training the teachers better. That's part of it. Um, it's also about development of screenings, early intervention, behavioral health, early child mental health uh, specialists, having those kind of coaches and specialists, you know, uh, support the teachers. And so that opened up a whole new kind of door mm -hmm. to, hey, this is not just an early childhood issue, this is a health issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that, again, opened up doors to, you know, you know to even, you know, to, to, to uh, steal Danielle's so you know, I, I don't know about cannibalizing, but, but leveraging <laughs> health funding, healthcare funding to address some of these mm -hmm. early learning issues. Um, you know, around suspensions and expulsions. So that's a, yeah. and, and a lot of, you know, uh, we see that more and more uh, being taken up by, by the advocates that we fund in states to, um, to work on these issues. Yeah, I mean, I think I would just say that the more practical um, translation of research into practical action steps, you know, I, I see that there's good partnership. I mean, mayors and cities are really taking advantage of, of studies to, to kind of hold their ground in terms of not losing funding or why this is important. But I do think translating that research into practical action steps of like, what does this look like on the ground in terms of programs and policies? I think that would be a really, gr there's more need for that kind of practicality. Um, I'm thinking about an example in Rochester where the, the mayor was, um, took on a, a robust, um, you know, early learning um, investment and a number of, of three and four year olds in preschool increased and when they looked at the data when kids were about to go into kindergarten you know they weren't making the the gains that you know the numbers didn't didn't represent what she thought and when she looked at the data deeper they came into the program so far behind developmentally they had made those increases in gains but if they just came in so far behind and so that's why she took on a very robust um, investment three-year pilot on developmental screenings like identifying earlier um, but that took a long time. We almost lost like the entire early childhood investment because the data just wasn't reading itself. So helping, re you know, elected officials think about and know more deeply about the practical implications of some of the research. And um, I just think there could be just more dialogue, you know, with different aspects of higher ed in a more practical way about what they're finding. Um, that would be helpful. Seminars, forums about you know, with leaders at the local level, but translate it into practical terms. Yeah, I think um, research is a really big word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to long-term evaluations, and there's advantages and disadvantages to short-term, quick and dirty look at the data, and we have to make sure we're doing all and both. We, but to get there, you have to make sure you are collecting the right data on all the children, that you're not excluding immigrant kids or language minority families or the poorest families or even middle and high income families. So you have to really shape research and know what you're collecting and why. We often do research studies um, that in the end are not as helpful as they could be. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we repeat research studies that we've already done, right? So 
can research be helpful? Absolutely. Like, I live for research. Please give it all to me. I love it. I love repeating back the facts that we know that, about what works for kids. But what a lot of folks at the state and local level need is immediate feedback. And so really creating systems that do both, I think, is what we need to be doing. And you can't do that without the university systems, without money to pay for that evaluation, without the thoughtful leaders at the state and local level who know what they need and how to use it, and, that, and, and are being responsive to the families in their communities in the moment. And there are numbers of examples of that. Neil Halfon out, out of UCLA has done a ton of work with communities using data dashboards and giving immediate feedback that's worth looking into. He's in the audience, by the way. Hi, Neil. <laughs> I didn't even see you there. <laughs> that was not planned. He did not pay me. It's all good. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I guess I, I'm curious to know, for, for those of you that are ready, willing, and able to interface with researchers and shape the research questions and say you've looked at this data, but what about this other data or this subpopulation? Do you have those opportunities and where, ha where are they? And, and how do you, you know, what advice do you have about forging more of those kinds of connections? Yeah, I mean, researchers, yes, we all, I think we would say we all have opportunities to talk to researchers. Um, I think this is one of the places, and Albert referenced this, where philanthropy can really help us think about what the questions are and find the right people to help answer those questions. And I think making sure that, again, it's about having the right perspective on what you're trying to do. And so, making sure that there's funding available for those long-term questions, like what's going to happen to those children after in UPK that have had those developmental screenings, being able to do those comprehensive assessments, the Tulsa study, the Tennessee study on the quality of the program and have we really changed what's happened for kids. These things all matter over the long term, right? But there has to be a commitment to long-term funding for them. There have to be people in place to do it, and there have to be those ongoing conversations. So, so the Alliance funds a few um, organizations that do research, <coughs> and we also fund um, organizations that help translate the research, um, particularly for around the advocacy context, in the advocacy context. So for example, um, many of you probably know Child Trends. Um, they do a lot of great work in um, uh, research, not only in early childhood, but really throughout the lifespan. And, um, and so one of the things that we fund them to do uh, again, because we have this kind of unique you know, combination of state and national organization, is that sometimes we provide, you know, they can provide uh, state advocates with a very kind of layman's terms of like what the research says, but th that's also accurate. <laughs> There's a lot of times, you know, when you translate research for advocates, if you don't do it right, the advocates are gonna not gonna know that, and they're gonna say something not not quite true. And the researchers so, are sensitive about that. I too. understand. <laughs> so I've I've, I've kind of been in that middle sort of liaison role uh, in a lot of times. So so we fund organizations like Child Trends. We also uh, have funded uh, the National Center for Children in Poverty up in New York, um, uh, New York City, to uh, do some research around uh, mental health and social emotional learning, uh, more particular to this topic, uh, where they have been working with a state advocate, for example, to help do some sort of needs analysis around mental health in, that, in, in Maine particularly. <clears throat> and then they've recently you know, come up with a report with recommendations and hopefully in the coming year, you know, again, without funding, the, the advocates can sort of pursue some of those recommendations around early childhood mental health. So, so those are some examples of kind of bringing the research and advocacy. Well, and I think Danielle made a good point in saying yeah, there's all kinds of research. I think one of the things that we continue, as I say, that our system is a work in progress for early childhood and health, is that integrated data system that you collect your ongoing data that you're collecting. But unless you're willing, unless all of the entities are willing to share their data, then you don't really have a good integrated understanding of, of how the program and if you're making progress. We're getting there, but you know, they'll, they'll say, well, there's HERPA laws and education. Uh, you can't give this information <coughs> and you can't do that. And so truly those become barriers that until you can get people to sit at a table and agree yeah. that we can share this information without infringing on anyone's turf, uh, we really can't make the progress we need to make. And I think that's just an ongoing uh, struggle that you continue to deal with, that everyone feels safe, that they can contribute their piece of the puzzle 
uh, into that system and then again for funding uh, for knowing whether you're making the progress you want to make it's it's critical yeah the data is a, a big challenge and I think uh, in a lot of communities there are is more of a at least a recognition of the need for these integrated data systems that span multiple sectors multiple stages of the life course and you know that's just a gold mine for researchers so we're always uh, looking out for that um, and of course the funding and uh, I was interested in your comment earlier about how, uh, depending on the policymaker, when you're talking about infants and toddlers, there's a real opening among the, the, the key health policymakers. And so I'm wondering what other observations you all collectively have with respect to bridging into the healthcare sector, those policymakers, those funding streams. It's obviously big. There's a lot of leveraging that can be done. I'm going to go with that word. <laughs> um, and uh, just what <coughs> what your experiences and challenges have been, and it, you know, if research, any research can perhaps help accelerate some of that bridge building that I think we all think needs to happen. I, mean, I think one challenge is just that um, again, from the early childhood advocacy perspective, healthcare can be a kind of a black box, right? And um, so we've, uh, the run of some of the new f grantees in our network include the National Ac Academy for State po Health Policy and uh, the Georgetown University Center for Children and Families and really, uh, you know, help, uh, you know, basically providing resources for them to, at the very minimum, educate our advocates about some of the intricacies of healthcare issues and also just kind of the pressures and incentives that people in the healthcare system need to respond to and what what kind of you know what turns them on for lack of a better way of putting it and what really kind of are barriers for them mm -hmm. you know even if it's legal what are the barriers to mm -hmm. doing something to support early childhood education so that's one that's one mm -hmm. yeah, I think about um, you know <coughs> we have a, a number of mayors that are looking more at prenatal to age three, and so that has really opened up the space to engage with the health sector. Um, the work in Fort Worth, I, I'm thinking about with the um, North Texas Health Science Center um, at the university has really been a, a, a really great anchor partner for the mayor to think about. Um, they're also a let's move cities and towns, and so you know, I think part of this is like how do you build and layer your work, and so if you're part of let's move, the first ladies initiative, and then you think about going down the pipeline birth to three. How do you engage some of the local medical centers? I know um, that Cook Children's Medical Center, uh, one of the major hospitals, have also kind of helped anchor some of that work. But um, I, I would say overall, we do have a challenge locally with, with having some of the larger um, the, the health insurance and some of the more health players at the table. And so what we've been doing is to really help them think outside of the box and leveraging City Hall and that leadership piece in terms of how do you bring some of those um, health sectors to the table, the plan and strategic planning table to help you think about your work. But we do see more and more um, of, of movement in that direction because more of thinking about the zero to three pipeline as well. And that really does um, also open opportunities at the county level because many of the services um, that are um, prenatal um, or zero to three are on health count uh, the county based mm -hmm. service. Mm -hmm. So the mayors are working with county executives in a very different kind of way to kind of bridge the gap and bring some of the more medical folks to the table and systems, the health system to the table. But there's work to be done on, on that arena. And I think to just build on that, when you're talking about policy and advocacy for legislators, for example, you know, bringing the, uh, the dental association to the mm -hmm. table, talking about the and, and vision screening and your mental health and your nurses. So, but when you get associations that are mm -hmm. actually endorsing and advocating for uh, early childhood and for the health and the benefits, you know, those are the things that then you start getting numbers and mm -hmm. then you start getting legislators' attention. That it's not just a person talking about how important uh, dental screening. It's the dental association and the state dental director talking about how critical this is to to young, healthy children. And so that's back to that the partnerships. Very, yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, back to the partnership. The thing I would add to that, my advocacy approach is get on whatever train is leaving the station, right? So whatever the legislative or local initiative is, tie it to that, right? So one of the big things that's going on 
is education reform. We want to we want to make our kids be better readers by third grade and be more successful. Well, one of the things you have to know is what's going on in a community. We've documented food deserts. We're starting to document child care, child care deserts. We should also be documenting, particularly in low-income community, communities served by Medicaid, the lack of providers, both for physical and mental health and dental providers, to serve children, especially children from non-language, uh, non-English speaking communities. And once you can show that data, and you can show the impact on kids, we had a child in Maryland about 10 years ago who died from the lack of a Medicaid, um, a, a, de de a dentist who would take Medicaid. Once you can start showing those impacts and actually document that the data shows those kids do not have access to the physical and mental health care providers they need to be successful on those third grade reading scores, you start to be able to have those conversations at the state legislature in a very different way. A very <coughs> recent example of how the medical profession and healthcare profession can support early child advocacy is we have a <coughs> grantee in, in Texas where uh, this past session, it was a very controversial and contentious session, but one bright spot, one win they mm -hmm. get, we got was that they passed a bill to provide more access for postpartum depression screening mm -hmm. through the child's Medicaid coverage. And that was done in partnership with the, um, I believe, the Pediatric Association and the Texas Medical Association. So kind of this combination of early childhood and health advocacy, I think. And, and to that point, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that next week, actually, we, again, working in partnership with the Georgetown uh, Center for Children and Families, are bringing together our early childhood advocates in our network and the, and the health advocates that they have, they have a connection to in the same place, in the same room together to sort of talk through these kind of cross-cutting issues, but also to talk about getting on the same page around advocacy strategies and messages and, and really trying to, you know, it would be a first of hopefully, um, you know, a, a number of conversations about how to work together in a more collaborative way. And again, if we lose investments in Medicaid, we will lose these kind of innovations that serve children and families at the beginning of their um, learning continuums. And I do think, you know, pediatricians and others that are in that child health, squarely in that child health space, health care delivery space, are very much seeing how much children, how unwell children are in so many of these communities. They have their own challenges within the broader health care system in terms of, you know, making the case for prioritizing young people and setting them off in strong starts in life. and. You know, their budgets, as they like to say, are rounding error on the overall health care budgets. But of course, these early life investments are the key to driving down both the needs and the costs that are consuming our <coughs> national conversations right now. Right. And again, going back to the, um, the infant toddler issues, you know, and, and linking that to the UPK study, like one lesson is that you just go where the kids are, right? And in that case scenario, the kids happen to be in the, in the pre-K setting. For infants, the doctor's office Whereas where hopefully a lot of them are at least having some touch points. And so, um, you know, thinking about where, what, the, what that, the health provider there can, how they can also support early childhood issues, whether it's childcare or, or early childhood mental health, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, I mean, we have Reach Out and Read, which is about literacy, and you have doctors talking about language and reading, and so we can, you know, think about doing that for in other ways um, to make those connections at the healthcare provider setting. And thinking about things like how can state policy incentivize private medical insurers to better serve infants and toddlers, to do all of the EPSDT uh, screenings over the course of the baby's first year, to encourage families to come. In the, if you look at when infants are supposed to come over the first year, it's every week, every two weeks, once a month, right? So how do you make sure that you're seeing those kids? You incentivize people. Is there something you can do through the tax structure? There's something you can do through the way that payments are given to private insurers? Is there something you can do through other state policies that work with the medical profession to encourage those kind of um, interventions with children and families? That's great. Um, we'd like to open up for questions from those of you in the room and anybody joining us by webcast can submit questions uh, at events at urban.org. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I obviously brought my pre-K three evidence-based <laughs> model with me. Uh, sorry, could you also share your name and sure, your organization? Sure, sure. Ambrose Lane Jr. and the Health Alliance Network. And this is Ambrose Lane the third. So he just entered pre-K three. Hey. Um, but in terms of the, the conversation and topics, I, I'm not convinced. I, I'm just not. I'm persuaded a little, but I'm not convinced. D.C. has had 
pre-K for quite a bit of time now, at least since 2001. And the communities, a couple things I'm gonna point out. One, 86% of African-American children in DC who attend pre-K attended in what are called racially isolated settings. Second, it's uneven across, pre-K programs are uneven across the city. And even in the Urban Institute's own report, it cites that uh, more affluent areas have less access to pre-K. Um, and then when you look at uh, the, the wards like Ward 7, Ward 8, or the ones that are more, more uh, health challenged, the health statistics, particularly in uh, chronic disease, have not changed, but have actually gotten worse. So there isn't an evidence that it is building resiliency in families. I work right now with Georgetown University and Children's National, how you doing? And Children's National on an ACES project that is targeted to families with children zero to five. And so we're trying to build that resiliency both in uh, educational settings and in uh, uh, physicians' offices. But I'm not convinced yet. I mean, I, I'm convinced that there's a need for early pre-K. I'm convinced of that. But I think it depends on the intentionality of legislators, the intentionality of educators, and the intentionality of community, as, as well as those in the health profession, as to what outcomes you want to get out of pre-K uh, pre settings. And so that, I think, determines more so than anything else whether or not you're going to have something that's going to have population-based health impact from pre-K. One of the elephants in the room that I have not heard is social determinants, because that is the elephant in the room. So even if you have great pre-K programs, you still have children that go home to neighborhoods that have negative social determinants of health that are brought to bear on a regular basis. So un un unless those things address those negative social determinants, then you're almost kind of spinning a wheel or a dog chasing its tail because there's no evidence that as they get older, if those social determinants don't change, mm -hmm. right. that, those, that, that, that the health outcomes change in any significant way. And the, and the numbers yeah. bear that out in chronic disease. So um, everybody's looking at me because I used to run the DC Public Schools Early Childhood Program, so <laughs> I'm thrilled and we should talk more. Um, so let me say a couple things. First of all, when we say early childhood, we probably should have started with this. We mean children from birth through the age of school entry and in many cases into third grade and it should be a continuum of services for all children that the infant toddler years are just as or possibly more important than the threes and fours and we shouldn't start at four if children are not born at four that's the other cliche right but we should be investing if it was up to me every one of our low-income communities would have birth to five centers that include the following they have on-site medical uh, physical and mental health providers they have early intervention services they're doing developmental screenings for every single child at every age range that's coming in to see a provider they have library services they have camps year-round right so we need to think totally differently about how we structure what we have unfortunately one of the things that has happened is we have in understood brain science and started to think about interventions and how you can invest we look at the science for children birth to five, we understand how important those years are, and the number of interventions at, infants, at the infant and toddler years are enormous, they're very, very complicated, they're very expensive, and often policymakers go to an easier answer, it's not an easy answer, and we start investing at four, with a plan that eventually will go down. That is a that is a, an investment strategy that doesn't actually benefit children and families on the whole. It addresses one piece of the puzzle. No part of this was ever supposed to be the whole answer. We have to start thinking as they have in West Virginia, and we, I mean, I can't tell you how wonderful what they've done in West Virginia is, to think about all the pieces together and bring them, bring them together where children and families are as a set. When West Virginia started what they were doing with their, with their model, the Secretary of Health and the Secretary of Education went around the whole state together and talked about why these services had to be done in partnership. Everywhere they went, they went together. That, doesn't hap that hasn't happened anywhere else, and that is what we need. And that will start to get at what you're talking about. Many other things have to happen, but it has to be that much more holistic approach. I don't know if you want to say anything. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I would.
would just add that, you know, I, I really hear what you're saying and, and another plug for Neil and EDI because I, I, I do think okay. <laughs> that tool is really important because you have to know like where your deserts, like like what resources are, are in certain communities or not in certain communities. And so mapping and for local officials to have a, a really good sense of like where services are, where the kids are and kind of do that kind of comparison. Uh, we do see a number of local leaders looking at early childhood and health in a more poverty, uh, economic well-being lens. And, and so um, just down the road in Richmond, um, the mayor there has an Office of Community Wealth Building, and early childhood and health has is, is recently just been placed underneath like wealth building and thinking about moving families from, you know, along the continuum, building capacity and economic mobility. Um, NLC has an economic mobility task force where mayors are really beginning to think about like the poverty and, and the supports that are needed to move families uh, out of poverty into a, you know, living wage and, and, and just up the upward mobility in terms of economics. So thinking about this holistically, it's, it's challenging, but I think leaders are recognizing housing is, you know, wherever I go on a site visit now, people are like, just stop talking. Folks need housing. Um, it's, it's, it's central and key to so many of the issues, whether you're looking at workforce, the early childhood workforce, parents and families. So I, I think there is a recognition and a lot of mayors are looking at this in a more holistic way, but it's certainly, it's gonna take some time, but I think it's happening, we're seeing that. I was going to say something, but if there's an, I don't want to take all the time with one question. But you, can, you can go. <coughs> I can go. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of, I'll be quick. So in terms of, from a, again, from an advocate's perspective, I think there there is always this tension between what can happen, what the policymakers are willing and put put their political and and resources behind, political capital and resources behind, and what the whole vision and what the need is. And I think working, having been working with advocates for the last more than more than ten years now, like that's. That's that's the challenge, and I, I, I so so. Do you wait until you get everybody to behind this whole grand vision and invest in the whole thing at once, or do you get what you can and sort of build from there? I, and I would admit that oftentimes you get what you can, and then and then there's no follow through, and there's no follow up, and that's the that's a problem. Yeah. So I'll just put that out there. Neil, since your name has come up a couple times. <coughs> I hope I don't get in trouble for this loud. Uh, I, I, I want to make a, just a couple of comments. One, to your comment that we need this sort of holistic, integrated, zero to five kind of framework. Uh, the United Kingdom tried that uh, through their Sure Start programs, and uh, it had a remarkably big impact and was part of their whole goal to reduce poverty, and they brought education and health together, and they did that. Just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the investment that they were making, they were making about a nine to ten billion dollar a year investment in the Sure Start programs, and they built 3,500 Sure Start programs, which were these comprehensive early childhood centers from zero to five in the UK. That that's the equivalent in the United States of we would need about 35,000 Sure Start centers, and that's the equivalent of about 150 billion dollars. When we look at what the Obama administration was putting into early childhood, there were a couple of zeros off between the level of investment that actually needs to take place to put a new infrastructure in place. We're going through a massive change in our society right now as we move from the industrial to this IT age, and it's massively disruptive for families and economic development in terms of families and the chaos that it's creating, and we keep sort of treating the symptoms. You know, when we moved from an agrarian age to an industrial age, it was massively disruptive, and we went through 40 years of child-saving movements putting in place a way of connecting human development early on with family development and social development, economic development, so that it was aligned, so that it was all working together. We've torn all that apart, and what we're seeing in the rural areas is it's falling apart because it's no longer sustainable economically and socially. So that as we think about what we have to do here, you know, a piecemeal approach where we continue to look at this little bit and this little bit, I agree with the comments over here that, you know, we're dealing in a sense with a massive change and it's not just social determinants, and it's the entire social fabric that's sort of falling apart at this point. 
Uh, I watched last night on the, how many of you watched the All-Star game last night? <laughs> Not many, right? <laughs> uh, I did, but in the sixth inning they had a, the part where they did stand up for cancer, right? And it's very moving to see the stand up for cancer when the, everybody is standing with those signs and saying who their mother was or the umpires are talking about their wives or the players are talking about their grandmothers, but it's a movement that's been created in a sense. We have to have something similar, like stand up for, to the social cancer that's going on for the kids in this country, Absolutely. in a sense. Let me just yeah. say something. I'm not afraid of big numbers. My husband works in defense, and he calls our, policy, our programs budget dust. It's amazing we haven't gotten divorced over that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but think about, when you think about the federal and state budgets, there is, we are not investing in young kids. First Focus has analyzed the federal budget and shown that it's not a children's budget. We should not be afraid of speaking our truth about big numbers and asking for those big numbers. And by asking, I mean demanding, marching in the streets, saying what our social cancer is, and really talking about the true needs of children and families. We're going to spend $4 trillion on health care, and we're only spending 5% of that on 95% of the children budget in the country. So if we're going to make health and education come together, there's a lot of money in the health care system that needs to move upstream into children, and we need to figure out how we start doing that. But I don't think it's one little piece at a time, one little research project at a time. I think we have to be thinking more comprehensively and what the poll strategies are. We're not going to push them there. We have to figure out how to pull them, what's going to actually move us in that direction. So yep. Yep. To be a little bit Pollyanna-ish, um, because I feel like th this is, these are really big, complex sort of challenges. But you know, what I see is that over time, and, and with um, you know, acknowledging the work that people like the Neiman uh, Collaborative and others have done to really make people understand, help people understand the science between, between er behind early childhood, I do think that, that there's a lot of um, penetration that's been happening at, in the state policy level. Um, that said, I think the challenge, the sort of next phase of advocacy in my mind in terms of the challenge is, is getting, you know, people are saying the right things, but they're not doing enough. <laughs> so you have to say, the, so how do we help, how do we get policymakers to, you know, to put the political capital behind what they're saying, mm -hmm. to make, you know, this a priority when there are competing priorities, um, and, and com you know different ways of spending t state dollars, like putting you know putting the money where the mouth is, basically. You know that's the hump that I feel like our advocates and, and in my you know in my op in my observations we need to get get to. And I think that's messaging. You know, there's a narrative around small government efficiency, the sanctity of the family. I think we have to sort of think about how to work within that context, at least for the foreseeable future. Okay, yeah. okay I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Liza Douglas with the American Heart Association, and uh, we obviously care a lot about the health of the environment that the children are actually in. So we've been talking about just the sheer existence of early childhood care environments <laughs> and an impact on health, uh, but I'm surprised that I'm not hearing more about the quality of those environments themselves and how city, state, county level policy around licensing of centers or accreditation of centers could very literally and tangibly improve the health of children in those settings. But I don't know, maybe quality has to come after access. We would like for it to come together. Um, but I'd like you to comment on any work that's done around the health of the environment itself. Screen time, nutrition, that? physical activity. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the reason you didn't hear a lot about quality is because many of us up here started from an early childhood frame and wanted to talk about the health piece. That all, for us, goes without saying. And in the studies that were, uh, the research studies, quality is an underlying prerequisite. Both of those programs are very high quality, and that's why they were doing it. Absolutely, quality matters for young kids. It cannot be said enough. Licensing is, in most states, is not enough. We need much higher quality settings for children. Again, that costs money. Early Head Start, which is some of our highest quality programs for infants and toddlers, costs between eighteen and twenty-two thousand dollars per child. State pre-K programs vary from about forty-five, five thousand dollars to twelve, fourteen thousand dollars. It's slightly higher in the district for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. It costs money to do quality. When it comes down to who gets quality, we know that um, across the country, 
families have varying access to high quality programs. Low income children who qualify for Head Start are actually more likely to get quality programs than um, slightly than families just above the poverty level or middle income families, and we really have to change that. But again, when the financing system is on the backs of families, most families, especially low income families, can't afford 12, 14, 18 thousand dollars a child. And so we have to think very differently about the financing system for early childhood so that we can make sure that every single child has access to a high quality program that meets their needs from infancy through school entry. Quality should go without saying. We know what the components of quality are. We know what the inputs of quality are. We know how to assess the process quality of teacher-child interaction while they're in the classrooms. We can all, you know, NAYC's accreditation package tells you what's in high quality. The National Association of Family Child Care has similar accreditation um, guidelines that tell you what quality looks like in home settings. Head Start is, is and should be the gold standard of what children should be getting each and every day, regardless of their income level. We know what quality is. We have to figure out how to get every child those high quality settings. Yeah. The licensing, and Daniel knows better than anybody else probably on the stage, but licensing has been a long, people have worked on licensing a long time. And I think the, the reauthorization CDBG, you know, put a lot of focus on the imp uh, uh, making the, the bar, you know, I like would say incrementally higher, but without money, um, which is what Danielle was talking about. So, so the financing of our child care, I don't know if, uh, how much you know about it, but like it is problematic. And, and uh, you know, both in terms of the lack of it, but also in terms of the, what it pays for, or how little it pays for in terms of quality. So then the pay parents end up paying it, or the providers you know, somehow find money, cannibalizing other funding streams to, to pay for the quality. So that, that's been a challenge. That said, I mean, I think, again, you know, we, we find out bright spots where we are. So we have some advocates in our, in our network that are working on this and, you know, on, on health. So in Texas, again, the, our grantee is working on improving licensing standards for childcare so that there's higher nutrition standards and, and more standards around um, physical activity. Um, so that may be like minimal and baby steps, but Absolutely that's, important, yeah, right. that's where we are in some places. Well, and again, the, uh, just a real brief addendum uh, about partnerships, but it takes your community, it takes your schools looking even in your career tech programs of creating programs that start educating uh, young people about uh, professional tracks that they can take. And how does that tie into the community college? And what is the level of accreditation for child care centers? And what are the requirements for child care givers? And how, and how do we call that a profession when we look across the board and they're the lowest? We, we say that our children are our most precious component, and yet child care providers are the lowest paid individuals on the spectrum. And so it, but it starts with building between your educational institutions and offering legitimate programs that can that can then build quality child care centers uh, and and building that with the health component nurses but it is it's a challenge and unfortunately uh, we still live in a society where uh, where the least paid are expected to give the highest quality sometimes I mean it's very unfortunate when, and as Danielle mentioned you know many families can't afford just can't afford center-based and um, one thing that we find that local leaders can do is connect to those informal providers those informal caregivers uh, whether it's by financial um, lack of finances or just choice a lot of parents prefer you know informal cultural um, practices are, are consistent with their own beliefs and practices so I think connecting those informal caregivers and providing opportunities for training to improve the quality of those environments is something that we're seeing um, a lot of local leaders trying to connect to those informal networks to, to make sure they're part of, of the system of, to improve quality of, of training and, and care for children. Okay, um, I want to thank our wonderful panelists for this conversation. <laughs> and Marge will send us out with some observations. So oh, I, I want to also thank both panels and also all of you for what's uh, really, I think, been a meaty uh, conversation. Um, it seems uh, to me that, that part, some of what we've heard is that uh, practitioners working on the ground clearly get the linkages uh, between early uh, childhood education, children's health, and 
economic mobility, access to economic opportunity over the long term. Um, they talked about the complicated feedback loop, so it's not causality going in one direction, but causality doubling back between those outcomes for what could be a really virtuous cycle. Um, but I think a lot of what we heard is how difficult it is to translate those basic insights into uh, action on the ground, much more easily said than done. Um, it requires a significant, um, if not humongous, uh, investment of public resources, and it requires um, partnerships among organizations that have really different missions. Um, and it either requires uh, some really serious attention to what are the concrete next steps that are going to make a, these linkages make a difference, like building health screenings into a UPK program, or, and or it means acknowledging the huge scale of the problem, as Neil was talking about, really the transformation that's underway in our society and our economy and what that means for, for our kids and our future. Um, so uh, I, th I think we also reaffirmed that practitioners um, can really uh, benefit when uh, researchers help build the evidence base, make the case, do that cost-benefit analysis, help them figure out what works and what doesn't, what pays off. Um, but um, researchers are not always great uh, at engaging with practitioners and policymakers and advocates uh, in understanding what are the questions they need answers to today. And I think what do these new data we've just collected mean in the context of your program, your choices, your next steps? And I think um, many of the researchers in this room and who spoke today are working to get better at that, to figure out how to do that better, while also preserving uh, their reputations for objectivity and independence and truth-telling. Uh, so I think that's all work that all of us are, are in progress on. So um, as we close, um, I hope you'll stay for a reception. Uh, you'll have a chance to talk further with the panelists and with each other about the topics we've, we've touched on today. But I think there will also be an opportunity to take in some of the work of the District of Columbia's Our Children, Our Community, Our Change Initiative. Um, and I'm really excited that we are, are sharing um, this, this work with you uh, because at Urban, we really have a special commitment uh, to bringing our expertise and making a contribution to our home city and region. Um, and we try to work really closely with uh, policymakers and practitioners and advocates here to help build and apply evidence uh, to improve outcomes uh, for people and communities in the District of Columbia and the region around it. Um, I don't know if Gustavo Velasquez is here. Gustavo, are you here? He might be out at the reception. He has joined us uh, to help lead our uh, DC work, particularly the engagement with, um, with policymakers and uh, practitioners. So here's just a little bit about our children, our community, our change before you get some food and a drink and uh, see some of its work. Um, this is an initiative that's using the early development instrument to gather rigorous citywide data and apply it to spark action across sectors uh, with the goal of putting all of the city's children on track for real success in school and in life. Um, the Office of uh, the State Superintendent of Education serves as the lead local agency rolling this data collection tool, the early development instrument, across the city. And RAISE DC is a multi-sector partnership that brings government agencies, nonprofits, philanthropy, and businesses together around very explicit uh, sort of collective goals for children's well-being and success. So um, in the lobby, you'll get a chance to see some maps um, and some of the data that the initiative is producing. I think we heard a lot of examples about how some mapping and some data can really, really catalyze attention and action. And uh, our guests uh, uh, include Elizabeth Groginski, uh, the Assistant Superintendent of Early Learning at the Office of the State Superintendent of Education, and her colleague Rashida Brown. 
And we also have Laura Dallas McSorley, Senior Director of Early Childhood Initiatives at RAISE DC. Are you, the three of you, stand up and make yourselves, or maybe they're already out there? Okay, sorry. Um, so the logistics are food is next door. Uh, the bar is out in the reception area with um, uh, graphics, maps, visuals, and more mingling. So thank you again, and thanks. Uh, <laughs>